Over the next three weeks, we're going to dive into what it looks like to marry well, to love well, and to finish well. Whether you're single, engaged, newly married, or have been married for decades, there will be something to take away for every season of life. Join us in person or online for our next series, Marriage Hacks. Welcome to Mex Online Campus. Well, it's obviously Super Bowl weekend, so let's start off with seeing just how much you know about the Super Bowl. I've got 10 questions from the Super Bowl or about the Super Bowl to test your football knowledge. Now, for the record, I want you to know that I knew the answers to all 10 of these right after I read the answers. <laughs> so here we go. What team has played in four Super Bowls but never held a lead? So the Arizona Cardinals, the Minnesota Vikings, the Cleveland Browns. Got your answer? Sorry, Minnesota. It's the Vikings. Which two teams are tied for having won the most Super Bowls? Is it the Colts and the Cowboys, Packers and the Patriots, or the Steelers and the Patriots? I hate to throw anything to Pittsburgh fans because they're so obnoxious, but it is the Steelers and the Patriots. Which teams haven't appeared in a single Super Bowl? Is it the Browns? Is it the Lions? Is it the Texans? Is it the Jaguars? Or is it all of the above? All of the above. <laughs> this one's tricky. Which Super Bowl halftime show preceded a stadium-wide blackout? Let's see who remembers this one. Was it Bruce Springsteen, Prince, uh, Beyonce, or Michael Jackson? Beyonce in 2013. Well, which team has participated in the most Super Bowls? Doesn't mean they've won, but they've, they've been in the most Super Bowls. Those are the Cowboys, Packers, Steelers, or the Patriots. Okay, that one's easy. Patriots, they've been in 11. Can you imagine? Well, since that was easy, let's get tough. How much does the Lombardi Trophy weigh? <laughs> Is it seven pounds, 11 pounds, five pounds, or three pounds? Well, it's about the weight of a newborn baby. Here's your hint, seven pounds. What two cities have hosted the most Super Bowl games? Is it Los Angeles and Miami, Miami and New Orleans, New Orleans and Dallas, Miami and New Orleans. All right, number eight, what NFL legend never got a Super Bowl ring? Was it Dan Marino, Bart Starr, Roger Staubach, I actually met this guy. Nice guy. He does not remember meeting me, but I remember meeting him. It was Dan Marino. Okay, number nine. Who holds the record for most passing yards in a Super Bowl? Was it Cam Newton, Joe Montana, or Tom Brady? Well, as a diehard Panthers fan, I wish it had been Cam Newton, but the answer, Tom Brady. All right, one last one. The most important trivia question of all. You ready? 1.3 billion of these are consumed on Super Bowl Sunday, and 1.3 billion is spent on this for Super Bowl Sunday. Is it chips and beer, wings and beer, or beer and beer? <laughs> the answer, wings and beer. Okay. Test over. But just for fun, a bonus question. Not on trivia, but more of a poll. Those of you who are, if you're watching in a group, you can raise your hand. Or if you're by yourself, raise your hand. How many of you want San Francisco to win? Okay. How many want Kansas City to win? How many think Taylor Swift will make it from her concert in Japan to Vegas in time for the game? How many don't care? <laughs> It's funny, all things Taylor has become such a thing. Uh, one of the ways you can actually bet on this year's Super Bowl is the number of times a camera will pan to her box seats. You can also bet on whether she will be shown holding and eating a hot dog, what colors she'll be wearing, what song of hers the CBS broadcast team will play first, and of course, the big one, will Kelsey propose to her at the game? The current odds... <laughs> On that one are actually running at just six to one. Okay, moving on from America's unofficial national holiday. We've been in a series on marriage hacks. Uh, things that really work when it comes to marriage. 
We started off with a look at hacks related to marrying well. Then last week, we looked at hacks for loving well. Today, we're going to look at hacks for finishing well. And let me tell you what I mean by that. To finish well means that you see your marriage through to the end. This year, Susan and I will celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary, but we have not finished well because we haven't finished. I'd like to think we're finishing well, <laughs> but the jury is still out on the final verdict. In Christian wedding vows, we say very clearly what the finish line is, till death do us part, which is why we've talked about these hacks in terms of eras. The first era, marrying well, those are the hacks you need on the front end to ensure that you make a wise choice with who you marry. So those hacks, if you were with us, had a lot to do with compatibility. Then comes the second era, loving well, which has to do with the heartbeat of married life and specifically keeping that heart beating. And so that meant last week when we talked about that, we looked into things like learning the language of love and the practice of love and operating out of the basis for love. But you can marry well, and you can love well and not finish well. Any relationship can be undermined, it can be sabotaged, it can be sidetracked, it can be destroyed, even among those who married well and who knew an awful lot and even practiced a lot about loving well. And there's a reason. They didn't employ the three hacks we're going to talk about today. Three hacks that are deeply rooted in the Bible's counsel to all married people. So let's get into them. Here's the first one. Become one. Because it's not too late. It's never too late. When we kicked off this series, we talked about marrying well. You remember I talked about, if you're with us, the importance of spiritual compatibility. That you should marry someone who shares your faith. That there's no greater, more foundational mismatch than a spiritual mismatch because it's the highest, deepest level of intimacy that two people can share. In fact, that's the whole idea of two becoming one in and through marriage, which is a deeply biblical idea. It's a Christian idea, two becoming one. Here's how Jesus talked about it. He said, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. See, that's the goal of marriage. Such intimacy, such bonding that the two become one. But becoming one is a God thing. It is a spiritual act. Two becoming one happens when God joins two people together. Not just when two people decide to get married, it's when God joins two people together. Because you can't get that close apart from connecting spiritually. If a relationship with God isn't present in both lives, he can't join you together. He can't be the tie that binds. You have to share spiritual territory to cross over to each other in and through that territory. So here's the hack for finishing well. Even if you didn't use it when you were in the stage of marrying well, become one now. And here I'm obviously speaking to those of you in spiritually mismatched marriages who do not currently embrace your spouse's faith. And I'll speak to you as if you're the husband um, because a lot of the time that's the way it plays out. Um, do you know what's going on with your believing, faith-filled Christian wife. She's scared and she's hurt because you're not open to faith. She so wants you to lead the family spiritually. She so wants you to take the lead in this relationship. She so wants you to know Christ. She's frustrated because something that has become so important to her can't be shared with you and she loves you so much. And she's afraid because she doesn't know what the future will be hold, will hold if she keeps growing in her relationship with Christ and you don't. And she fears that the gap between the two of you will just keep getting wider and wider and wider. And even more important, even though I know you don't buy into this yet, she fears the day when the person she loves most in this world will stand before a holy God and give an account for his life. And she knows right now 
what that verdict would be, how that would turn out. So will you do something for her and for yourself? Just, just, just be open to faith. Go, just go into exploration mode. You're a smart guy. Check it out. Find out why other smart people chose to become Christ followers. Because like you, they're not stupid. Uh, and so, you know, <laughs> if I find out why other not stupid people <laughs> become Christ followers. You have questions about science? Get them answered. There's a lot of scientists that are Christians. You have questions about the Bible? Get them answered. You've been burned by Christians or a church? Process it, because I don't care what you've seen or what you've experienced that may have made you so cynical. Those were people-driven experiences. They weren't Jesus-driven experiences. People will disappoint you. Jesus won't. So process that stuff so that you can begin to look at it objectively. And I'll tell you something about Mac. This is one place that will do everything it can to help you do just that without ever making you feel awkward about it. You want to know why? Because so many of us have had to go on the same journey and do the same thing. I don't know if you know this, but over our entire 30-year run, over 70% of our total growth has come from people who were previously unchurched. They were just like you. I don't know of any other church that has that percentage, but, uh, but there's a reason why we do. I mean, we, we get your questions, we get your skepticism, we get your cynicism, we get your barriers, we get your junk. So look into it. Have you ever heard of Pascal's wager? He was a French intellectual in the 17th century who put all this stuff with God uh, in terms of a wager. He put it, he says, okay, you're, you're going to bet your life in one of two ways. Either there is a God or there's not. And then he said, if you live your life like there is a God and then there is, you've won. If you live your life like there isn't, and there is, you're screwed. Okay, that's my translation of the original French, but it's pretty close. <laughs> if you live your life like there is, and there isn't a God, you've lost nothing. So when it comes to living as if there is a God or exploring whether there is a God, you have everything to gain, you have absolutely nothing to lose. So for your sake, and for the sake of your marriage, explore. It's just a no-lose scenario. You may not believe this now, and you probably don't, but if you want to finish well, really, really well, take your marriage to that final, deepest level, Christ living and breathing and present and unifying and empowering your marriage, the two becoming one. Okay, that's the first hack. Here's the second one for finishing well. Don't flirt with an affair. I don't think anyone who enters into a marriage plans on being unfaithful, plotting out an affair, looking to commit adultery, but affairs happen. Even when the person involved would have said they were on the front end in a relatively happy marriage. In fact, only one out of every four men who have had an affair reported having marital problems on the front end. 75% were happily married which means that entering into an affair can happen to anyone, to people who started off never intending to have an affair and to people who are right now in a good marriage or who leading up to the affair were in a good marriage. Nobody wants to do this though. Everybody knows that having an affair rips apart the very fabric of trust needed for marriage to survive. No one I know who has children would wants to even begin to envision what it would do to those children or their relationship with those children if they were unfaithful to their mother or their father. In fact, an affair is so egregious to a marriage that it is one of only three things that the Bible would say can legitimately end a marriage in the eyes of God. The other two are abandonment. Either they abandon you or they act in such a way that they force you to flee, such as when there's physical abuse. And the other is when your spouse dies. So abandonment, death, and adultery. And adultery made that short list because marriage wasn't meant to take that kind of unfaithfulness, that level of betrayal, that, that level of assault on mutual trust is such an undermining of everything marriage is meant to be that it effectively kills it. So why would someone who never intended to go down that road and would even say that right now they're reasonably happy in their marriage, why would they have an affair? 
because they made the mistake of flirting with one. And what they didn't know was how dangerous it was to flirt with one because they thought it wasn't that dangerous. They thought it was innocent. And they don't even know sometimes what's involved with flirting with one. So let's talk about it. Here are four ways you can flirt with an affair. And the first one is going to make a lot of you uncomfortable, but it's just, it's just so significant now more than at any other time in recent memory. The first way you flirt with an affair is you engage pornography. It's been said that the most important sexual organ you have is your brain. It is true, which is why what you do or do not do sexually is going to have a brain component. And your brain on porn is not a good step. Jesus was very clear about this. The Bible records, in fact, these words from his teaching. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, that obviously isn't just men looking at women, it's women looking at men. And Jesus isn't talking about a passing glance or even appreciating the fact that someone is attractive. He's not even talking about sexual attraction because we're sexual beings. We're going to find people sexually attractive. He's talking about the look of lust. That's what you have to monitor and control. The look that lingers. The look that involves the desire, the fantasy of having sex with someone. The look that feeds the inner sensual appetite left to itself that would give in to desire alone and leave the boundaries for which it was created. That's where sexual sin begins. And that beginning is so strong. It is so real. It is so decisive. It's as if you've already gone to bed with him. Now, make sure you get this one down. Jesus is not saying that the thought and the act are, are the same. So that if you give in to the thought, well, you might as well just go ahead and, you know, follow through with the act. No, no, no. What Jesus is saying is that the thought is the first part of the act. It's not innocent. It's not to be made light of. Treat that first look as if it was the act itself and resist it with that kind of energy and that kind of resolve. Because sexual sin is more than just the final act of intercourse or intimacy. The final, the act itself is, is the culmination of an infection that was allowed to spread into your heart and into your soul. Something like an affair in all of its forms, it doesn't just happen, it begins. We're in bed with someone mentally and emotionally long before we are in bed with them physically, which is why porn is so detrimental to faithfulness in marriage. Its goal is to arouse you sexually and to engage you sexually and to titillate you sexually and to promote a sexual response. And guess what? It works. The research of Paul Wright at Indiana University has found that men who regularly view pornography are more likely to engage in casual sex, have multiple partners, and to cheat on their spouse. It's also been proven that the more you view porn, the more it creates a distance between you and your spouse, both emotionally and physically. It's common for those who watch porn to find themselves unable to be sexually aroused by their actual flesh and blood partner. According to the research of Dr. William Struthers, it creates unrealistic expectations. It conditions your brain to bond and attach to pornographic images as opposed to a real partner. It counterfeits true intimacy. And as studies have now shown from both Norway and California, porn and the people in porn become a, a, a third party that invades the relationship, which is why study, um, a study in the archives of sexual behavior found that when one spouse finds out the other is using porn, they just intuitively, naturally feel it's a form of being unfaithful. Because it is. So that's first. Here's a second way to flirt with an affair. Feed an existing attraction you have towards someone. In other words, gravitate towards, spend time with, work at getting to know someone you find yourself physically, sexually attracted to. In other words, the opposite of what has become known as the Billy Graham rule. If you're not familiar with that, it's about a, a personal pledge that the famed evangelist Billy Graham and his closest associates made. It was back in November of 1948, as his public ministry began to take hold, Billy called his team that was then made up of uh, 
Bev Shea and Grady Wilson, Cliff Barrows, up to his hotel room. They were in the midst of an evangelistic campaign that they were holding in Modesto, California. And he said, God has brought us to this point. Maybe he's preparing us for something we don't even know, bigger than we could ever imagine. Let's try to recall all the things that have been a stumbling block and a hindrance to evangelists in years past. And let's come back together in an hour and let's talk about it. Let's pray about it and ask God to guard us from those things. When they gathered back together in Billy's room later that afternoon, they had all made essentially the same list. Uh, I mentioned they were in Modesto, California. They ca came to be known among them as the Modesto Manifesto. <laughs> from it, they made pledges to guard themselves, among other things, against the two most damaging to the cause, the inappropriate use and allure of money and sexual immorality. In terms of sexual purity, the rules were simple. They just avoided situations that would put them alone with a woman. On the road, they, they roomed in close proximity to each other as an added margin of social control. They prayed for supernatural assistance in helping them stay pure. In other words, Billy and his team built um, these protective sexual fences, if you will, around their lives. Now, today, some find those rules prudish and out of touch with the way men and women interact in today's world, even need to interact. And there's some truth to that. But one thing you can say is that Billy finished well <laughs> when it came to sexual faithfulness in a day when many don't. But regardless of his particular rules, that you should have some rules, I think goes without saying, and me too. And the one we're talking about in particular, be careful how you interact with someone that you know you already have an attraction for. Be careful in regard to being alone with them. Watch out for that long lunch alone together, that after work drink, staying late, working together on the project. Be careful how much innocent banter, playful banter that goes back and forth between the two of you, just the level of familiarity that you let take root. This is common sense. It doesn't mean you can't ever be alone with someone of the opposite sex or be in a car with them or have lunch with them or have a closed door meeting with them or talk to them. Just be aware of situations that you know put you in a compromising situation and particularly when you know you're already attracted to them. If you're attracted to someone physically, you'll need to put up a heck of a lot more barriers than if you're not, as opposed to trying to catch them by themselves to talk, trying to work late with them, trying to have that lunch with them, trying to travel together on that project or to make a sales pitch purposefully stalking them or following them on social media, and on and on it goes. It can look so innocent on the surface, justifiable if ever questioned, but you know what's going on inside you. You know what you're doing. You know the attraction level. And you know if you're consciously feeding it or you're consciously starving it. Well, a third way to flirt with an affair is to maintain the space needed for a shadow life to emerge. This is something I've observed multiple times in people's life. And early on in working with people, I didn't really have the right language to put around what I was seeing and stuff, but I, I do now. To betray the trust of marriage through an affair, to pursue that kind of shadow life takes a certain amount of space that is kept from your spouse, a certain amount of, of time, a certain amount of separation or privacy. And here's what I've observed. The, the space for the shadow life doesn't follow the affair. The affair tends to follow the space. In other words, the fact that there is a space, that there is this, this world, that there's this environment, that there's this entire separate set of relationships, separate from the world that you share with your spouse, is what can allow an affair to emerge. Let me just give you two examples out of scores of others where I've seen this played out. Many years ago, I knew of a man who lived in one city, and he worked in another. He commuted by car. And he ended up in an affair with a woman that he worked with in that city. He was attracted to her. And then he began feeding that attraction by spending time alone with her over meals and then dropping work off at her house while her husband was gone, knowing that that was going to be the case. And all of it was completely cut off from the world of his wife and his family and his home. In fact, later on, after it all came to the surface, his wife said something really interesting to me. There was a, a bridge that uh, was over a river that separated the two counties that he had to go over every day when he drove to work. And in that 
when you cross over that bridge from one county to another, from where he lived to where he worked, she said it was like when he crossed that bridge, he just entered a different world and was able to become a different person and chose to. He had the space. Another man I know traveled extensively, but he rarely if ever took his wife or children with him. But he did travel with female co-workers. In fact, he tried to have it be female co-workers and not male, and often added extra days at the end to sightsee and relax and would invite them to join him. He ended up over the course of the years in multiple affairs and along the way losing everything that he had built. Do you see what I mean by creating the space for a shadow life? And again, while some people enter into an affair and then begin creating the space for it to be pursued, what I've observed is that the space was usually there on the front end and it just proved to be fertile ground for an affair to be entered into. So if you and your spouse live in two different worlds and you're not inviting each other into those worlds in a way that makes it a little bit more like a shared territory, you're flirting with an affair. Well, a fourth way to flirt with an affair is to have a dangerous conversation. And here's what I mean. You can have a conversation with someone that is inappropriately intimate, inappropriately revealing, inappropriately vulnerable. And it doesn't matter whether it's in person or online. In fact, a lot of people think if they have a personal conversation with someone through, say, texting or something, it's just not the same as if they were having it in person. And I want to say, <laughs> really? It doesn't matter if you speak it or write it. Inappropriate is inappropriate. There are conversations you can have with someone that crosses a relational line that should not be crossed. Uh, something that should only be discussed either with your spouse or with someone like a pastor or a Christian counselor or a family member. For example, talking with someone about the sexual relationship that you have with your spouse or about previous sexual experiences you had before marriage talking with someone about how handsome or attractive they are, commenting on various body parts, obviously telling sexually suggestive or themed jokes. Um, but the conversation that I've traced more affairs back to, just working with people over the years, the one that is the most dangerous of all is the one that you will be the most tempted to engage. It's confiding in someone about something difficult in your marriage. It's confiding in someone that you're unhappy in your marriage. It's talking about the challenges of your marriage relationship with someone other than, again, a pastor, counselor, or family member. It's getting into those feelings. It's getting into those desires. When a man and a woman start confiding with each other about their marriages, it can so quickly lead to an affair. You're just opening up in a way that is inviting it. And it can just start off so innocently. They're just a sympathetic friend at work or they're a listening ear. They're an encouraging voice. And when they share, oh, how much they get it and how much they understand. And they're going through some things like that themselves and their marriage. And they offer you sympathy right back. Oh my goodness, you're in dangerous, volatile territory. So if you want to flirt with an affair, keep watching porn. Feed your attractions toward other people. Keep allowing space for a shadow life to emerge and thrive. And engage in deeply personal and revealing conversations with someone like a coworker about your marriage. In other words, do anything but use the marriage hack for finishing well which is don't flirt with an affair. Well, here's one last hack. <sighs> take down the exit sign. Just take it down. Now, here's what I mean by take down the exit sign. When you enter into any kind of a relationship or situation and you have an exit sign that you automatically put up and illuminate over the door of that relationship, you are starting off knowing you could leave. Not just could, but might, you know, it's always there, kind of like a security blanket. You're making the option clear. You're saying to yourself that exit sign is there just in case I need it. I don't have to stay in this. There's an escape. There's a way out. It's bright. It's illuminated. It's clear. It's hanging over the door. Take it down. Get rid of it. You can't have that sign exist. Unless the person you're married to has so violated the marriage covenant that you have to, you know, they physically abandoned you. They've committed adultery, been unfaithful to you. They've physically abused you or your children. But that's a short list, friends. For the ups and downs of married life, the hits and the hurts, the trials and the tribulations, the frustrations and the frictions, if you want to finish well, 
In the midst of all that, no exit signs. There's just a single paragraph written over your heart. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, and to death do we part. This is why when Susan and I have gone through difficult times, and believe me, we're 40 years, we have our fair share, just like anyone else would, we know that the one thing we can't have, the one thing we cannot allow, is an exit sign over the door. Because if it's there, you'll think of using it. It will be one of the options. It'll be seen as a way out, quick, easy, and escape. But when there is no exit sign, I mean, you've kind of burned your ships. You, you have one and only one choice. We've got to do whatever it takes for this relationship to flourish. We, we've got to figure this out. We don't have any choice but to figure this out, invest whatever amount of work is needed to see this one through. You invest whatever amount of work, whatever amount of time, whatever amount of effort needed because there is no plan B. In fact, when you follow the hacks for finishing well, you don't even want one. Let me give you a taste of what I mean. It came to me through the life of a man named Robertson McQuilkin, who was president of Columbia International University, and his wife, Muriel. I remember I shared this once many years ago, and it just came to mind again. It, it was um, the, the whole story of Robertson and Muriel it, and, and what unfolded. It began, it started on a vacation that they were taking together in Florida. Muriel on that vacation repeated a story she had just told five minutes earlier to some friends that they were visiting. And then that began to happen more and more frequently. Three years later, when she was in the hospital for testing, a young doctor pulled Robertson aside and told him that he may need to think about the possibility that she had Alzheimer's. He didn't believe it, he didn't want to believe it. But then her memory deteriorated even further. They went to a neurologist and after a battery of tests confirmed that she did indeed have the disease. Her loss of memory turned into an inability to even continue a train of thought and soon she couldn't read and she couldn't write. She never knew what was happening to her. Where once there was this vibrant, creative, articulate person, there was now a process like a slow death, a light dimming out, a fade from life itself. And McQuilkin found himself torn between two commitments, two divine callings, the growing needs of his wife and the demands of his career. He made the decision to approach his board of trustees with the need to begin to search for a successor, that when the day came when Muriel needed him full time, that she would have him. He was 57 years old at that particular time, and it seemed unlikely that she would hold out long enough until he could retire naturally at 65. But they didn't want to act on his request so they made no plans. And while he appreciated their response, he, he knew it was neither realistic nor was it responsible, which led to years of struggle of, of, of what should be sacrificed, his role as president or the caring for his wife. His trusted lifelong friends all urged him to stay at the helm. They said, hey, institutionalizing your wife is the best course. She'll grow accustomed to her new environment. But all he could think about was whether anyone would love her in such a place, let alone love her as he did. He had often seen the empty, lifeless faces of those lined up in wheelchairs along the corridors of bare hallways and waiting for the fleeting visit of a loved one. For a while, he arranged for a companion to stay with her in their home so that he could go daily to the office, but by this time, she'd lost much of her comprehension. She could hardly express any of her thoughts. Yet when he would leave, she would take out after him, trying to follow him wherever he went. Sometimes she would take out after him as many as 10 times in a single day. Sometimes at night, when he was helping her prepare for bed, he would find her with bloody feet. When he told the doctor, the doctor's eyes filled with tears. And all he could choke out was such love she has for you. And then he explained that, that the characteristics developed across the years um, come out at times like these. Her heart's longing was always to be with him and to be near him. And this was how all of those feelings were being channeled. But being with her was not easy. 
When they went to the grocery store, she would begin to load other people's carts and take off with them. She would refuse to eat or take a bath. Uh, he was used to meeting multi-million dollar budgets and designing programs to grasp emerging global opportunities, but none were as demanding as this. So the tension built, full-time with Columbia or full-time with his wife. And his wife's deteriorating condition made the moment of decision draw ever near. Again, his friends circled around him and told him that while he was at the peak of his impact and influence as president, he would never, you know, he, he just couldn't do anything else for his wife. Then the time finally came. He had to decide. And finally, he did. Robertson McQuilkin resigned as president of Columbia. And I want you to hear what he said when he did. It was never intended to be made public. I'm not even sure he knew it was being recorded. Um, none of this even came to light until years later. But we have just under two minutes of what he said to the students and the board of trustees. Take a listen. I haven't in my life experienced easy decision-making on major decisions, but uh, one of the simplest and clearest decisions I've had to make is this one, because circumstances dictated it. Uh, Muriel, now, uh, in the last couple of months, seems to be almost happy when with me, and almost never happy when not with me. In fact, she seems to feel trapped, becomes very fearful, sometimes almost terror. And when she can't get to me, there can be anger. She's in distress. But when I'm with her, she's happy and contented. And so I must be with her at all times. And you see, it's not only that I promised in sickness and in health, Till death do us part, and I'm a man of my word. But as I have said, I don't know with this group, but I've said publicly, it's the only fair thing she sacrificed for me for 40 years to make my life possible. So if I cared for her for 40 years, I'd still be in debt. However, there's much more. It's not that I have to, it's that I get to. I love her very dearly, and you can tell it's not easy to talk about. She's a delight. It's a great honor to care for such a wonderful person. And he did take care of her to the very end. No affairs, no exit sign. Two who had become one until death they did part. That was finishing well. And I, for one, hope I get a chance to do the same thing. Well, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your love for marriage, your vision for marriage, your heart for it. For those who are on the front end, you want them to marry well. For those who are in it, you want them to learn how to love well. And you want all of us to finish well. We're weak. We need you. We don't just need your hacks. We need you empowering them. And so that's our prayer this day, Lord. And I pray it on behalf of all of us in the name of Jesus. Amen.